welcome to episode 46 of Gods and Heroes of Ancient Greece. My name is Mylanda Butterworth, and today we continue with the tale of Oedipus, with Oedipus and Polynices. Even so, Oedipus was not to have any rest. From his brief journey in pursuit of the daughters of his guest, Theseus brought word that one who was close kin to Oedipus, though he had not come from Thebes, had set foot on Colonius and prostrated himself as a suppliant before the altar in Poseidon's temple, where Theseus had only just made offering. That is my son, Polynices, Oedipus said angrily, my son who merits nothing but my hatred. It would be intolerable to me even to talk to him. But Antigone, who loved this brother because he was the gentler and kinder of the two, succeeded in soothing her father's wrath and can, gained him some consent, at least to hear his unhappy son. First, Oedipus begged his protector to be ready to aid him in case an attempt was made to lead him away by force. Then he had his son summoned before him. From the very outset, Polynices bore himself very differently from his uncle Creon, and Antigone did not fail to draw her father's attention to this. I see someone approaching, she cried. He comes alone. Tears are streaming from his eyes. Oedipus only turned his head away, asking, Is it he? Yes, dear father, she answered. Your son, Polynices, stands before you. Polynices threw himself at his father's feet and clasped his knees. He looked up at him, and grief ate at his heart when he saw his beggar's dress, his empty eyes and his gray hair blowing unkempt in the wind. Too late I see all this, he moaned. I confess. I accuse myself. I forgot my father. What would have become of him had my sister not given him care? Father, pa, I, father, I have wronged you. Can you forgive me? You're silent. Oh, speak, and do not turn from me in such relentless anger. Help me, my sister, to unclose those bitter lips. First, tell us what brought you here, said Antigone gently. Perhaps your own words will cause him to break his silence. And Polynices told how his brother had driven him from Thebes, how Adrastus, king of Argos, had received him and given him his daughter to wife, and there he had won seven princes with their forces as his allies in a just cause, that these had already encircled the region of Thebes. Then he begged his father to go with him, promising that once his malicious brother had been dethroned, he... Polynices himself would put the crown in his father's hands, but his son's penitence could not soften a spirit so deeply offended. Infamous wretch! Oedipus cried and made no move to raise the supplicant from the ground. When the throne and the scepter were yours, you drove your father from the land. You yourself put on him this beggar's cloak, which moves you to pity, now that you have had to endure like hardships. You and your brother are not my true children. Had it depended on you, I should have been dead long ago. But the vengeance of the gods awaits you. You will fall in your own blood, and your brother in his. This is the reply you may take to those princes who have declared themselves your allies. Antigone hastened over to her brother, who had risen from his knees in horror, and recoiled from his father. Obey my most fervent wish, Polynices, she bestowed him. Return to Argos with your host. Do not make war on your native city. That is impossible, he answered, after a moment's hesitation. Flight would mean disgrace for me, more than disgrace, destruction. Though both of us be doomed to perish, we brothers still cannot be friends. And he freed himself from his sister's embrace and left with a troubled spirit. Then Oedipus resisted the tempting promises held out to him by both factions of his kinsmen and yielded them up to the gods of vengeance. And now 
the arcs of his destiny, close to their full circle. Crash after crash of thunder sounded from above, and the old man stood his voice from heaven and called for Theseus with urgency and longing. The darkness of impending storm crept over the land, and the blind king trembled with the fear that he might die, or his reason be impaired before he could utter to his host his gratitude for all the kindness he had received at his hands. But Theseus came and Oedipus gave his solemn blessing to the city of Athens. Then he asked its king to obey the call of the gods and conduct him to where he could die, untouched by the hands of any mortal. And behold, only by the eyes of Theseus, to no one should he point out the place where Oedipus had left the earth. Never should the grave which held him be revealed, for in this way he would defend Athens against her foes more than spear or shield or the strength of many allies. His daughters and the people of Colonus were permitted to accompany him part of the way, and the train wound into the shallow of the grove of the Aranes. No one was allowed to touch Oedipus, and he, the blind man, who had been guided thus far, seemed of a sudden to see. He walked erect and strong in the van of the procession and led the way to the goal fate had appointed him. In the middle of the grove of the Aranes, the earth gaped and the opening was rimmed with a threshold of bronze, the mouth of many winding paths. Legend, taking shape from various ancient tales, had it that this cave was an entrance to the underworld. Oedipus chose one of the twisting ways, but he did not let his retinue accompany him to the grotto itself. Under a hollow tree he halted, sat down on a stone, and undid the belt of his stained beggar's dress. Then he called for water from a flowing stream, cleansed himself of the dust of his long wanderings, and donned a festive robe which his daughters brought him. When he rose, refreshed and renewed, thunder rumbled up from the bowels of the earth. Tremulously, Antigone and Ismene clung in his arms. He kissed them, and he said, Farewell, my children. From this day on you will be orphaned. But while he was still clasping them close, a voice like a clapper striking on bronze vibrated, none knew whether from heaven or from the heart of earth, saying, Why do you loiter, Oedipus? Why do you delay? The blind king heard and knew that the god was demanding his own. He loosed the fingers of his children, and he laid them in the hands of Theseus to show that he had put them in his care for the rest of their lives. Then he bade all turn their backs on him and leave him. Only Theseus was permitted to approach the threshold of the opening. His retinue and his daughters obeyed him and did not look back until they had gone a long way. When they did, a miracle had come to pass. There was no longer any sign of King Oedipus. No flash of lightning split the sky. No thunder crash. No storm winds swept the grove. The air was quiet and serene. The dark doors of the underworld had opened noiselessly, and the old man, purified and free from pain and regret, had descended into its steps, as though born on the wings of gentle spirits. Theseus stood alone, shading his eyes with his hand as if a vision too awesome and divine had dazzled his sight. They saw him lift his arms to Olympus and then throw himself on the ground, making supplication both to the immortals in heaven and to the gods of the underworld. After this brief prayer, the king returned to the daughters of King Oedipus and assured them of his protection. In unbroken silence, his spirit filled the holy divinings, and he went back to Athens. And here is where I end my tale of King Oedipus. But I'll be back with more tales, many, 
more tales. Until then, my friends, enjoy the journey.